is that the purpose of Mount Rushmore is as a place where one can contemplate the individual and collective meaning of patriotism. The mountain behind me is dedicated in part to four American patriots, men who dedicated their lives to the service of their country. Collectively, the four also symbolize the first 150 years of American history. They themselves are a memorial to the generations of Americans who worked, served, sacrificed, and persevered across that first century and a half. Yet for all that it means symbolically, when we look at Mount Rushmore today as a physical sculpture, as an actual carving, it's also immediately clear that it is incomplete. The artist had always intended to carve all four men down to their belts, but if you look up there today, you see four faces, some with rough edges, and the top part of George Washington's coat. Now the reason that Mount Rushmore was never finished is in and of itself a tale of individual and collective patriotism. See, in October 1941, when work on Mount Rushmore came to an end, it was because the United States stood on the edge of a challenge to freedom just as great as Washington faced in 1776 or Lincoln confronted in 1861. To overcome that challenge required the attention of the entire nation, as the need for a national memorial had to give way to the needs of national survival. Mount Rushmore was never finished, so the Second World War could be fought and won. Now, the story of American involvement in World War II, like the story of Mount Rushmore, is one of individual and collective patriotism. When we consider the individual, we can find so many examples of individual patriotism in World War II that are worthy of the four men on Mount Rushmore behind me. For example, in 1775, when word reached the Continental Congress that fighting had broken out at Lexington and Concord, John Adams rose to nominate then-Colonel George Washington to command a newly formed Continental Army. Washington turned out to be the right man for the job. Through defeat and privation, outnumbered and poorly supplied, he kept his army together and kept the spirit of the revolution alive. Washington's leadership was indispensable to American victory. 160 years later, another colonel named Dwight Eisenhower found himself in a very similar position. As World War II broke out, he too was catapulted up through the ranks to high command, and like Washington, turned out to be the right man for the job. At Normandy, Eisenhower planned and executed the largest amphibious operation in history. Then his Supreme Allied Commander personally oversaw the liberation of Western Europe. By the end of World War II, he was the third highest ranking man in the U.S. Army. And like Washington before him, the nation's trust in Eisenhower's wartime leadership eventually led him to the presidency. Now, unlike President uh, well, unlike George Washington, Thomas Jefferson was not a warrior, but he was a philosopher, a statesman, an artist, a musician, and a scientist. We can find the example of Thomas Jefferson and so many Americans during the Second World War who did not serve in uniform, but found their own unique ways to contribute their own talents toward victory. Filmmaker Walt Disney put his studio to work creating hundreds of training and propaganda films. Physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer worked on the Manhattan Project, developing the atomic bomb. Industrialist Henry Kaiser invented entirely new methods of shipbuilding. Even Dr. Seuss went to war, creating hundreds of political cartoons to bolster morale by lampooning the enemy. Now, as for Abraham Lincoln, he was our first true war president. By the time he assumed office, several southern states had already left the Union with more to follow. Lincoln rose to the challenge. He crossed party lines, assembling the best minds of the North into a cabinet one historian famously called a team of rivals. Over objections of Congress and even his own cabinet, he recognized the genius of General Ulysses S. Grant and promoted him to high command. Through the Emancipation Proclamation and the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln elevated the cause of preservation of the Union to the higher cause of freedom. And then on April 15, 1865, Lincoln was struck down by an assassin within days of Union victory quite literally giving his life for his country. Now, no wartime leader will ever be the true equal of Abraham Lincoln. The American who perhaps comes closest is President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Already president when World War II broke out, FDR found ways to rearm this country and supply our future allies, even as public opinion was against further involvement. Then on December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. The next day, Roosevelt addressed the nation, calling his people to arms by calling the Pearl Harbor attack a date which will live in infamy. After the Gettysburg Address, that infamy speech is probably the most recognized and certainly the most revered oration in American history. Like Lincoln, FDR was a keen judge of character, appointed the right people, including General Eisenhower, in the right positions to make a difference. And like Abraham Lincoln, President Franklin Roosevelt lost his life just as the United States grasped victory. 
Now, that's President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, not to be confused with President Theodore Roosevelt, who was on the mountain behind me. Before Theodore Roosevelt was president, most Americans knew of him as a soldier. When the Spanish-American War broke out, Roosevelt recruited his own volunteer fighting force. Known as the Rough Riders, his regiment was a mix of East Coast college athletes and cowboys from the Old West. On July 1st, 1898, Roosevelt led his Rough Riders in a charge uphill against the fortified enemy position we remember as San Juan Hill. For his heroism that day, he received the Medal of Honor and the fame that eventually led him to the presidency. Now, 46 years after Theodore Roosevelt led the Rough Riders of San Juan Hill, American troops stormed the beaches of Normandy, France. And one of the very first officers to set foot on French soil was also named Theodore Roosevelt. General Theodore Roosevelt Jr. was the eldest son of President Theodore Roosevelt. He was 56 years old at the time and riddled by arthritis. But as assistant division commander, it was his job to lead his men ashore. As he waded through the surf, he realized in all the confusion of the morning, his men had been landed on the wrong beach. Undaunted, he called his officers together, told them, gentlemen, we'll start the war from right here, and sent them inland to ultimate victory. Unfortunately, he did not live to see it. A little over a month later, he lost his life to a heart attack, likely caused by his exertion on that beach, and the campaign that followed. Like his father, he too received the Medal of Honor. Now folks, these are just a few examples of individual World War II patriotism worthy of the men immortalized on the mountain behind me. But let's not forget, Mount Rushmore isn't just about individual patriotism, but also collective patriotism. And here too, we find the World War II generation more than lives up to the example of the generations memorialized by Mount Rushmore. Throughout the Second World War, 16 million Americans served in uniform. They came from very different backgrounds, races, and creeds, but fought side by side on almost every continent and in literally every ocean. Meanwhile, back at home, tens of millions more Americans worked on the home front. They harvested more materials, built equipment and supplies, maintained infrastructure, generally did all the jobs necessary to keep our troops supplied and this nation working toward victory. Then when it all ended in 1945, the vast majority of those who worked and those who served got a chance to come home, enjoy together in peace what they won in war. For good reason, they remember today as our greatest generation. But it's important to also remember that not everyone came home. And perhaps that is where we find collective patriotism at its deepest. After the American Civil War, World War II is the deadliest conflict in our history. More than 400,000 Americans lost their lives for their country. Now for the Civil War, the place we as Americans most intimately associate with remembrance of those who gave their lives is probably Gettysburg. Site not only of the war's large and most important battle, but the place Abraham Lincoln chose to give the Gettysburg Address, probably the most important oration in American history. Now for the Second World War, there are two places, two battlefield cemeteries that carry a similar weight, a similar level of significance and symbolism to Gettysburg. One of them is the USS Arizona. December 7, 1941, Battleship Arizona went down during the Pearl Harbor attack in a matter of minutes, taking the vast majority of her crew with her. Throughout the Second World War, she remained in the exact same spot at Pearl Harbor. Her wreck a very powerful, very poignant reminder to Americans of exactly what it was we were fighting for. Now folks, it's been 80 years. Arizona remains in that exact same spot at Pearl Harbor. Preserved and protected by the National Park Service, she is the final resting place of more than 1,177 U.S. sailors and Marines who paid the ultimate sacrifice in the service of their country. Now, the other side of the world, on a bluff overlooking Normandy Beach, 9,000 more American service members lay side by side. Most of them lost their lives on the beach below or in the campaign that followed. Among them, two sons of Theodore Roosevelt. General Theodore Roosevelt Jr., who I mentioned to you earlier, is buried there. Alongside of him is his little brother, Quentin. Quentin was a fighter pilot killed in action in France in World War I, whose remains were later moved to Normandy. The president's two sons could rest side by side. Now, at Gettysburg, Lincoln defined the cause so many Americans had fought and died for as what he called a new birth of freedom. At Normandy, in the visitor center, the words of a general named Mark Clark are carved in marble, similarly defining what he believed so many members of his own generation had fought and died for in World War II. Quote, if ever proof were needed that we fought for a cause and not for conquest, it could be found in these cemeteries. Here was our only conquest, all we asked was enough soil in which to bury our gallant dead. Folks, in a little while, I'm going to turn on the lights and illuminate Mount Rushmore. 
As you gaze at the breathtaking sculpture above us, please contemplate the patriotism of those four Americans carved in stone up there. Please celebrate the collective patriotism of the generations of Americans who founded, expanded, preserved, and developed this country across those first 150 years. But as you continue to look at the mountain, as you notice where the sculpted surface gives way to natural weathered stone, as you note the work on Mount Rushmore that was never finished, consider that perhaps that too is a memorial. A memorial to a generation of Americans who had to stop carving Mount Rushmore so they could protect and defend everything Mount Rushmore stands for. Thank you very much, folks. States of America. It's hard to imagine, but not long ago, this great land of ours was pure wilderness. A place where millions of bison roamed freely throughout the plains. And those who lived off the land revered it as sacred ground. Yet this country would face a dramatic change, quickly becoming the most advanced nation in the world, in technology, in peace, and in power. From its inception, the United States has shaped itself under the guidance of strong leaders. Leaders who have taken risks, stood up to adversity, and never let go of their vision for a better country. Mount Rushmore reminds us of them, and the countless Americans who have made great sacrifices to ensure the lasting legacy of our country. Freedom. We strived for it. We die for it. We live for it. was 1923. The place, the Black Hills of South Dakota. State historian Don Robinson proposed that these granite outcroppings could be the site of an enormous monument dedicated to the heroes of the West, such as Lewis and Clark and Chief Red Cloud. But commissioned sculptor Gutson Borglum had a different concept in mind. Borglum was a passionately patriotic man and believed that a more fitting tribute should honor the American experience. <coughs> a memorial that would represent our ideals, our dreams, and our accomplishments as a country. A memorial that would convey a spirit of patriotism. Borglum chose his canvas carefully the giant granite rock face of Mount Rushmore. And in 1927, work on the mountain began. Borglum assembled a team of local miners, ranchers, and lumbermen to help with construction. The sculptor built a model of the presidency to serve as a guide. Every inch on the model represented one foot on the mountain. Year after year, Borglum and his crew hung perilously off the side of the mountain, drilling and blasting their way to reach granite solid enough for carving. It took 
14 years and nearly one million dollars to complete the four 60-foot faces. And even though the sculptor did not live to see the very final touches put into place, he was able to carry out his vision. Four great Americans immortalized in stone. Symbolizing the democratic society in which we live, the struggle for our independence, the fight for our freedom, and the sacrifices we have made since our country began more than 200 years ago. It was a time of rebellion and of war. It began as an uprising against British rule and turned into a full-fledged crusade for personal freedom and national independence. The American Revolution. From 1775 to 1783, up to 250,000 patriots engaged in battle. Even during the toughest times, when the Continental Army seemed undisciplined and ill-equipped, one man's courage and determination ultimately led the troops to victory over the British. The future father of our country, George Washington. Born and raised in colonial Virginia, George Washington grew up to be a firm believer in American independence. Even though his heart yearned for quiet family life at his Mount Vernon home, his deep commitment to the Republic made him answer the call of his country time and time again. As general, Washington became an instant hero throughout the colonies. The public was so enamored with him that many people wished that he become king. But Washington scoffed at such an idea. The army must serve the country, but not rule it. Express your utmost horror and detestation of the man who wishes to overturn the liberties of our country. George Washington, 1783. It was this kind of insight and integrity that made him the perfect person to oversee the creation of a new federal government. With no blueprint to follow, Washington kept the colonies united and on course during the infant years of this nation. And after ratification of the Constitution, when he was unanimously elected first president of the United States, Washington was keenly aware that he was laying down the framework for future presidents to follow. Washington's legacy is that of a man who was first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. In his inaugural address, he spoke of the task that lay before this new nation. The preservation of the sacred fire of liberty and the destiny of the Republican model of government are justly considered as deeply, perhaps as finely stated, on the experiment entrusted to the hands of the American people. George Washington, 1789. George Washington well did this union, but it would take another great visionary to expand it. Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thomas Jefferson, 1776. Thomas Jefferson was the voice of the American people inspiring patriots with his carefully crafted words written in the Declaration of Independence, the document that gave birth to our nation. It was also Jefferson who fought for religious freedom 
and the democratic notion that people should have a say in government, two very American principles we cherish today. Thomas Jefferson always thought of himself more as a scientist or scholar than as a politician. And it was this quest for knowledge that played a role in the greatest achievement of his presidency. In 1803, Jefferson acquired the French lands west of the Mississippi and the Louisiana Purchase, which doubled the size of the country. In an effort to find out what America now holds, Jefferson sent Meriwether Lewis and William Clark on their famous expedition out west. It was an exciting time of discovery for new Americans. However, what was good for a growing nation was not necessarily good for its original inhabitants. During this time of expansion, many Native Americans were uprooted from their homes and hunting grounds and pushed farther west. But during an address to a group of Cherokee chiefs, Jefferson prophesied about future relations between natives and new settlers. I shall rejoice to see the day when the red men, our neighbors, become truly one people with us, enjoying all the rights and privileges we do, and living in peace and plenty as we do, without anyone to make them afraid, to injure their persons, or to take their property without being punished for it according to fixed laws. Thomas Jefferson, 1808. Jefferson's dream was slow to be realized as conflicts between the US government and Native Americans set off a chain of events that dramatically reduced Native populations throughout the 19th century. Thomas Jefferson believed in the promise of America and had faith in the American people. But this faith would truly be tested nearly 60 years later, when the Republic came dangerously close to unraveling. The Civil War was the most tumultuous period in American history. The differences between the states had deeply divided a nation, pitting brother against brother on American soil. But it was the determination of one man to keep the United States united. Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president. Abraham Lincoln was a self-made man of great character a frontiersman who came from humble beginnings. When Lincoln was inaugurated in 1861, he faced more adversity than any other president in U.S. history. Many southern states had withdrawn from the Union. And even though Lincoln opposed war, he warned the South in his inaugural address that he would take whatever measures necessary to stop the rebellion. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. Abraham Lincoln, 1861. The civil war raged on for four brutal years. But Lincoln stuck to his commitment to democracy. His main objective was to save the Union, and he also strongly believed in freedom for all Americans. Until slavery was abolished, Lincoln felt the U.S. could never truly be the whole of the free. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation began the process that ended the evils of slavery forever. Over half a million Union and Confederate soldiers lost their lives in the Civil War. But during his famous Gettysburg Address, Lincoln reminded the American people what this war was really all about. That we here highly resolve that these dead should not have died in vain, 
that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that this government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Abraham Lincoln, 1863. Over the next 50 years, the United States would go through a dramatic transformation. The year 1900 was coming around the bend, and America was turning from a rural republic to a budding industrial power. This new century, which burst with hope, needed a fresh start and a fresh approach. It was Theodore Roosevelt, our 26th president, who led the way. Is America a weakling to shrink from the work of the great world powers? No! The young giant of the West stands on a continent and clasps the crest of an ocean in either hand. Our nation, glorious in youth and strength, looks into the future with eager eyes and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. Theodore Roosevelt, 1897. He was energetic, he was robust, and he was eager to show the world that America was a force to be reckoned with. Theodore Roosevelt believed in the strenuous life. Frail and sickly as a young boy, he overcame his illnesses and grew up to be a naturalist, a cowboy, a war hero, an author, and president of the United States by the young age of 42. His vigorous outlook on life transferred to the Oval Office. Roosevelt was a man of action. He promoted economic freedom and was a friend to the working class, protecting their rights against big business and what he called the criminal rich. Roosevelt also expanded the country's power abroad. It was his support of the 1903 revolution in Panama that led the U.S. to acquire territory for the construction of the Panama Canal. This massive undertaking not only created a valuable link between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, but it put the United States on the map in world politics. Yet, Roosevelt may be known best for his passion for the outdoors. He was vocal about conservation, and through the power of his presidency, he provided federal protection for almost 230 million acres of land. To waste, to destroy our natural resources, to skin and exhaust the land instead of using it so as to increase its usefulness, will result in undermining in the days of our children the very prosperity which we ought by right to hand down to them amplified and developed. Theodore Roosevelt, 1907. The pursuit of the American dream did not end with Theodore Roosevelt's term. Instead, it has carried us into the 21st century. Throughout history, countless Americans have made great sacrifices so that we can enjoy the freedoms of this land. the same freedoms guaranteed in our Constitution and Bill of Rights. The same freedoms millions of people have sought since the first immigrants arrived over 200 years ago. Gutson Borglum reminds us of this with his timeless memorial. Four Americans representing the birth, growth, preservation, and development of this country. All embodying the spirit of our nation. All advocates of freedom, dignity, and the ideals of American life.
Ladies and gentlemen, please rise and join in singing America's National Anthem. You'd rather video than go. Yeah.
Ladies and gentlemen, most of these men and women have never met each other, and yet tonight they are bonded together on stage. For most, this is the only public recognition they will ever receive for their willingness to serve. Let's show them how we feel about them with one more round of heartfelt applause. Service and Mount Rushmore National Memorial, I thank each and every one of you for your service to our country. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this evening's program. Please give our veterans an opportunity to sit back down, and then uh, we are all done. Thank you very much.